when I came home, the first thing I wanted to do was to um, to meet the first responders that that helped me that day. And so um, that was a, an incredibly uh, rewarding experience for me, but not just me, but for them. And I never realized that, you know, so often they're out uh, doing CPR and, and trying to, to save lives and there aren't many survivors, you know. Um, and no. so when they see somebody come and show up that they had worked on and, and know that they're still here for them, mm -hmm. after all the people that maybe they didn't uh, turn out so well, it's, it's certainly a, um, it's, it's a, it's a great experience for not only me and my recovery, but I think them and, and understanding how important their work is. Welcome everyone to another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. My name is Jelis Vaas, your host on this podcast and a fellow cardiac arrest survivor. Here on the show, I talk with other survivors in hopes of providing support to anyone out there going through the same journey. Occasionally, cardiac health professionals will uh, also appear on the show to answer any questions you might have about how to improve your life after surviving a cardiac arrest. We actually have our first health professional coming up soon. Um, but in this episode, I am talking to a fellow cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, namely Matthew Wood. Matthew shares his story of when and where he had a cardiac arrest, who saved him and some lessons he learned and some advice for other survivors out there. We also talk about uh, dealing with the invisible pain we go through as survivors, because often we look quite normal on the outside, but don't feel normal at all on the inside. Of course, there's so much more we will delve into. Um, you can also check out the timestamps in the description of this episode to see all the topics we talk about. And if you want to go to a, a specific uh, topic or point in the conversation. Either way, this uh, was a great conversation. And Matthew, he shares a lot of good insights that I hope can benefit and support you in some way if you're also a survivor. To find any resource mentioned in the episode, check out the show notes located in the description of this episode or go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Matthew. With that, I hope you enjoy this episode with cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, Matthew Woods. Matthew, a uh, warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super happy to, to finally sit down with you and uh, have this conversation. Thanks for having me. How did you had your cardiac arrest? Like, where did this journey start? So uh, before I get really into the cardiac arrest portion, I have to back up just a little bit. Um, two sure. months prior to my cardiac arrest, um, I had a heart attack. Um, oh, you did? So, yeah, I oh. had... Um, suffered a heart attack in uh, November of uh, 2022 and um, <clears throat> went to the hospital and had uh, two stents put in at the time. And um, I stayed in the hospital a couple of days and, and then got released and thought everything was uh, going to be fine from there, you know, so certainly was on some new medications and um, new regimens for sure. Uh, a lot of cha changes to my diet, to yeah. um, lifestyle changes, you know, that are normal for having had a heart attack. Um, <clears throat> so in the months that went on, I, um, I started doing cardiac rehab. That's part of the, the thing that they offer, you know, just mm -hmm. to kind of get back and exercising and have uh, somebody monitor your your heart rate while you're doing that and give you some education um <clears throat> but uh i also went on a trip uh with my spouse and during the trip um i started getting uh angina attacks or uh chest pains um, right. i had yeah. a series of those chest pains where i would have to take a a nitroglycerin um to to alleviate that. And okay. we were currently traveling at that point in time in Mexico. So I wanted to avoid having to go to the hospital 
uh, sure. while vacationing. And um, so when we return back... That's scary. We, it is very scary. Um, wow, because you're in another country, not in your hometown. Uh, wow. Yeah, I, I ended up calling the cardiologist while uh -huh. on vacation, uh, explaining what was going on. Um, he had a couple of recommendations for me, but uh, I guess long story short, um, you know, I continued to have issues after the heart attack. And so um, the holidays during Christmas time, I had a few more issues. And finally, in the beginning... Issues like what? Sorry. Um, I would wake up in the morning and have uh, chest pains as soon as I opened my eyes in the morning. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not exerting myself and um, literally was just sleeping. But as I wake up, I start to feel this, this crushing pain in my chest. And sometimes it would be mm. just like a heart attack where I'd feel radiating pain in the jaw. Yeah, um, yeah. Or even, or even the arm. So... Yeah. Um, that's when I would have to take a nitroglycerin. So, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt your story, actually, no. but uh, I'm just so curious also to ask, like, how, what was the experience of having a heart attack? Like, how did it um, feel? How did it feel? Uh, it it started off feeling. I thought um, I had thought that I was having a, a, a case of heartburn at first, mm. um, kind of like acid reflux. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was this tightness that uh, kind of came up into the throat area, um, mm. uh, a pressure that um, continued to feel like it was burning. Um, yeah. And uh, and then eventually I started feeling this intense jaw pain. And from mm. what I understand, some people get jaw pain, some people don't. Um, some people get arm pain, but I got a... An, a pain then that radiated down my left arm. At that point in time, I know I needed to go to the hospital. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, you know, certainly, certainly went to the hospital. They, they could tell I was having a heart attack um, after they hooked me up to the EKG. Uh, they immediately took me into a, what they call a, a cath lab or a catheterization lab. Yeah, um, yeah. Found, found two blockages. Um, mm. one typically they call the widow maker. Um, so it's, and then, uh, another mm. one in a, in a diagonal branch. Um, so, so then in, as time went on, I, like I said, I had, uh, angina pains at different periods over the next two months. And then finally in January, they went back in to, um, take a look at, uh, what was, previously fixed to make sure that nothing was getting blocked up again. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and they went and did a, uh, a third stint, um, in an area where was, um, close to being completely blocked, but, uh, not enough at the time when they mm. went in the first time. Um, so they did that in early January, early January. Yeah. Of, of this year. Yeah. 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 So um, about 10 days after that, on, um, on January 16th, which was a holiday here in the U.S., uh, Martin Luther King holiday, mm -hmm. um, I woke up in the morning and I continued to have those angina attacks as I've been having. And throughout the time since my heart attack, I was um, taking my blood pressure on a daily basis I would take notes as to how I was feeling, um, yeah. trying to document things for my cardiologist to make sure that um, I was telling him everything that I was experiencing from uh, how I was feeling on medications to what time of day I would have episodes and, and things yeah. like that. Um, so I routinely would use a blood pressure monitor uh, in the morning and I would do that, take my blood pressure every morning before uh, having coffee or breakfast or anything or taking any medications. And um, so that morning I had got up and I uh, took my blood pressure. It was normal, but I saw an indication on the machine that um, had a little icon on it that indicated there was an irregular heartbeat. Oh, okay. And so at that point in time, I, I didn't really know what that meant, but I could, I'd also noticed my heart rate was... Um, 
was lower than 60 beats uh, per minute. Yeah, and yeah. So, um, I had been documenting a couple of days prior to that about my heart rate getting low. And um, so I pulled out, I had a, uh, a fingertip pulse oximeter um, that I put on uh, just to see what my heart rate was at. And I saw it at 42, and then I saw it drop to 32. And um, from what I understand, you know, really your heart rate shouldn't be below 60 while you're awake. Um, yeah. Well, unless you're in general. Athlete. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so certainly that was concerning. Um, mm -hmm. I immediately grabbed my phone uh, to record some of that to, to show my cardiologist. And um, so I was taking a video on my phone and um, that's when I collapsed. Right. Wow. So uh, that was the last thing I remember until waking up in the hospital. Um, yeah. Kind of foggy memory for at least two days. Um, what I uh, it was it was after two days in the hospital that I finally came across that video again. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Because that um, was what you already mentioned before we started uh, recording, right? Right. That you actually recorded your own cardiac arrest. Yes. Not intentionally. Of not course, intention I didn't know no. what's happening. But um, but I how guess. is it to to watch that video or to listen to it? Because as you said, most of it was uh, black, right? The video. Yeah, so the, the video itself uh, depicts, you know, uh, the pulse oximeter and shows it going from, uh, of course, it's got a waveform on it um, that, that shows the heart rate, uh, but also shows what the pulse rate is. Um, it drops from 42 to 32. Um, then it ironically, and at that point in time, I don't remember anything else, um, but I'm still recording and um, you then see it spike up to um, 80 and mm. 120 um, right. and then uh, very fast and then nothing. Then you see the Crazy. line go and um, I essentially collapse. I drop the phone at that point. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the screen goes black, but you hear the, the audio of uh, my spouse coming down the stairs in a hurried fashion after hearing me hit the floor. Mm. Um, he'll say that he thought the China cabinet had uh, fallen over in the dining room. Sure. Um, wow. So, um, he, uh, he quickly came uh, and assessed the situation and you can hear in the audio him starting the 911 call. Um, God. Shortly after that, um, after 911 picks up and he starts talking with them, is when the video ends. Um, he's uh, he's found the the phone. Uh, must have mm. shut it off in trying to assist me. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, and watching that is. Um, at first, I was surprised that it's like wow, I had no idea I even recorded it because my yeah. memory was a bit foggy. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I wanted to show my cardiologist um because maybe it'll give some clues as to what happened right and um ultimately my cardiologist said you know i can't tell you why this happened it shouldn't have um so every indication from him um it can't seem to to address what was the the root cause of of having the cardiac arrest mm. Uh, wait, because you said also before we recorded, right? Because this was three months ago. Um, yes. So this was uh, January 16th. Of oh, this yeah. Year. Ja from January on. Yeah, right. Yeah. And do they have no idea, no clue at all on why you had a cardiac arrest? Um, you know, the, all they can say is that I had it with uh, ventricular fibrillation. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, but no clear, um, no clear diagnosis as to what triggered it. Um, I have, you know, from my own research, uh, a bunch of possible causes, but nothing concrete. And are there still any, any more tests that you have to do? 
to um, rule out even more possibilities of what he could have been? They haven't. Uh, they haven't offered any of those. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess I haven't really pushed to this point because right mm-hmm. now it's been, you know, in the in the first three months, it's more or less trying to make sure you're okay on the on the medication. Um, yeah. yeah. Make sure that you're you're healing okay, um, and so as long as all those things are going, they they kind of say, "All right, you're yeah. you're good to go," you know. Yeah, um, get out of here. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what, what what medication are you on? Um, I'm on a um, low dose aspirin. I'm on um, a generic form of Plavix. Um, okay. Uh, I'm also on uh, a low dose uh, nitroglycerin. That's yeah. that's extended release, um, and then um, some cholesterol medication. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, of course, I have other medication that's kind of as needed. Um, but not that I take on a daily basis. So that would be okay. like the rescue nitro. Um, if I were to be in the throes of a um, chest pain or having angina attacks. Um, so, but one of the medications between my heart, heart attack and um, my cardiac arrest, they did take me off of. Um, and that was a previous um, anti-clotting for the stints. Um, yep, yep, yep. So that a Berlanta medication that I was on, um, so I'm no longer taking that. Um, that could have been uh, and speculation that um, it could have been part of the low heart rate trigger. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's also my understanding that after having a heart attack, you um, are more susceptible to having a cardiac arrest. Yeah, I've read that a couple of times too, so... Yeah. Wow. All right. And I guess about three months, you know, that's not so long ago, right? That's super, super early in this whole healing process yeah. and this whole crazy roller coaster that you're in. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling really good. Um, yeah. Really, okay. Yeah. I, that's good um, to hear. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I've, you know, talk to so many other survivors and everybody's journey is a little different, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and certainly as, as everybody's story about cardiac arrest, the recovery is different. Um, I'm very thankful that, you know, um, mm. that Kenyon found me as early as he did, that he was able to start, uh, that he could call 911 and start the chest compressions yep. within, within two minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that is, is the large reason as to why I think my recovery is so, um, so well. Um, I've, you know, other people, uh, they may have, you know, longer physical or cognitive issues. And um, thank goodness I haven't had yeah. that experience. Um, so from that, that uh, standpoint, I'm, I'm doing fantastic. Well, that's great to hear actually, yeah. And the medication, like getting used to that, because that takes a while to actually. Yes. Um, so there's been, you know, some some slight adjustments to the medication since, um, uh-huh. uh, but nothing major. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. As far as you know, the the pieces that kind of just to fill in, you know, what happened um, to me uh, once Kenyon found me and the the paramedics showed up. They showed up. Uh, about four to five minutes after um, the phone call to 911. So we are fortunate to live so close to the uh, fire department. Um, And the only reason I know that they were here in that amount of time is because of the doorbell camera that also caught video that morning. Um, Wait, what do you mean the doorbell uh, camera? So, so we have a, like a ring doorbell camera that yeah. if somebody rings your doorbell or there's detects motion out front of your house, um, it'll trigger a recording. 
Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so yeah, a lot of the events that happened that morning were also caught um, on on the outdoor camera, at least in terms of the paramedics showing up and entering the house. Mm. Um, the time that they got there, um, which is, of course, was all helpful to me because the first things that, you know, I'm in the hospital thinking about is, well, how long was I out and trying to put together right. the pieces? Um, in fact, it was, you know, I, I, I needed to know what that timeline looked like. You know, it's mm -hmm. like I, for my own sanity of like, OK, so how long was I without oxygen? Yeah. And so so I know that the time of the first responders getting there was essentially within six, five to six minutes of my collapse. Mm. Um, the checks compressions already started at about the two minute mark um, mm. based on the video um, that uh, the paramedics uh, worked on me here at the house for about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes um, before, before you they, yeah. they loaded me into the, uh, the, the van and, yeah. um, and headed off to the hospital. And during that time, they did um, two rounds of, of shocks here in the house and um, another five on the way to the hospital. Oh, um, wow. So another five in the, to the hospital. Okay. So a total of seven shocks, um, mm. two rounds of the, uh, the antiarrhythmia medication and the, um, the adrenaline that they shoot into your, your leg. Yeah. And um, it was that last seventh shock just before getting to the emergency room at the hospital that I started coming to, um, mm. where I started breathing on my own, you know, stopped them from giving me anything else. Of course, I don't remember this. I learned this later on, basically, when I went to meet with the paramedics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And did they also, uh, do you also have an ICD? I guess you do, right? I or, do. Yeah. I do have an ICD. Um, when I woke up or started, you know, remembering things uh, in the, uh, by day three in the hospital, that's when I was told that um, I was going to get uh, an ICD or implant, or at least it was strongly recommended at that point. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I have um, I have the the combo with the pacemaker and and defibrillator. Yep, the same one that I have. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And how is that been to have an ICD now? Like, uh, is it healing good? Um, it's it's healed well. Um, you know. I uh, I can feel it um, pace, um, you know, because I was. Uh, they also have the the pacemaker function on. Yes. Yeah. So so the pacemaker uh, function that um, that had to be adjusted um, to a higher level just uh, for my own comfort because I was still feeling um, that my heart rate was getting a bit lower than than I was comfortable with. Um, so, so they adjusted it. So now I'm kind of set at, you know, 65 as my low end. Um, okay. I think I know what you're describing. Like you feel like the wires, like the electricity, when it's starting to pace, like you feel your ICD or the pacemaker doing something. I, I can feel like a, a flutter. Um, uh, sometimes I can feel a little electric current. Um, in there because I had that too uh, and now they lowered the pacemaker function in me so I don't feel it anymore but yeah that that's honestly that was quite annoying to experience that I, I thought right and and I guess it can run a diagnostic like once a day um, that will also give those sensations um, yes I think you can turn it off yeah I actually asked for that too because I was because my cardiologist told me, like, how could we make everything a bit better for you even? And I actually told him, like, yeah, this is so annoying. I feel it all the time, something happening in my ICD. And he was like, ah, yeah, that's probably, like, the regular checkups that he does every day. And they turned that off, which which improved a lot of things in, in general for me, in how I was feeling, right? Because like, uh, it was annoying. Yes. 
It, it certainly can be. And 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 cuz you don't know when it's going to happen and and it just kind of goes off and you're not sure uh is this is this appropriate or inappropriate um so mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and apparently you experience it more in a sitting position because of how your you experience it more when you're in a sitting position because of how your body is then shaped and i don't know something with the wires more getting close well apparently you feel it more than that's what he told me because of how your body is then shaped Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways to show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also, the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs. And if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. What is, how has your life in general changed, you know, after the cardiac arrest, but also the heart attack, of course, too. And what have been some difficult changes that have happened? Well, so, um, sorry, I just lost, totally lost train of thought. That's fine. It's fine. Um, take your time. As far as how things have changed, um, Hmm. Yeah, like with your job or other well, things. So, let me start. I guess before I um, before I had the heart attack or the cardiac arrest, I was I was laid off from from my last job. Um, kind of a blessing, you know, at knowing that I had to go through all this. I would have really hated to have thought about, you know. Uh, hmm getting back to work and while you're still trying to recover. Um, so, um, so yes, uh, eventually I will be changing jobs. Um, I, uh, I do plan to go back to work and I'm currently interviewing, um, for different positions. So, uh, we'll see what the next chapter in my, my career and, and future holds. Yeah. But how do you feel about having to change the job and having to have been laid off from your previous job like um emotionally how has that been for you um well it's given me some time to think about what is truly important and i think that this experience has also uh, made me think about you know how short life can be um and uh you know tomorrow isn't promised as they often say and um Certainly after experiencing a cardiac arrest, you see how quickly it can be taken from you. And so um, it's allowed me time to really evaluate um, things that matter to me personally and and maybe things that I no longer um, no longer want to spend time and energy on. Um, So. You had mentioned about things that have changed since. I think that, um, you know, you kind of evaluate those things of where you want to spend your time and how you want to spend your time and trying to find meaning and purpose of of what has happened to you. 
um, from this experience and um, where you're going to spend your your energy later on. And so, um, you know, I've noticed that uh, I have a shorter, I guess, tolerance sometimes for um, for time wasters, uh, for um, for people that may be arrogant or um, you know, sit, talk a lot and maybe have little value to say um, that, uh, you know, I guess I got a shorter attention span for, for giving that uh, my time. Um, so I think you just look at things differently. You do. Yeah. And it makes sense in a way, right? That you also look a bit at like, okay, you don't want to waste time because like you said, you don't know how much you have left of it. You know, the, the first 10 days out of the hospitals, you know, when I came home, the first thing I wanted to do was to um, to meet the first responders that, that helped me that day. And so um, that was a, an incredibly uh, rewarding experience for me, but not just me, but for them. And I never realized that you know, so often they're out uh, doing CPR and, and trying to, to save lives and there aren't many survivors, you know. Um, and no. so when they see somebody come and show up that they had worked on and, and know that that's still here for them, yeah. after all the people that maybe they didn't uh, turn out so well, it's it's certainly a, um, it's it's a, it's a great experience for not only me and my recovery, but I think them and and understanding how important their work is. Yeah, right. It gives also hope in that right. they're doing, that it's worth doing what they're doing, even exactly. though that the survival rate is low. There's still people like you, like me, who do make it. Uh, yeah. how, how did you meet them? Because I... Like, 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 did you reach out to the hospital and or how did you end up knowing who the people well, were? I know where the firehouse is, um, ah, yeah. and uh, I, I I just showed up there, <laughs> and um, you know the, the guy who answered the door uh, was uh, the person who worked on me <laughs> and recognized me um, before I even said anything, and um, then of course you know I formally introduced myself and um, told him that you know I'd like to come back and. And basically bring lunch for the uh, oh. the whole firehouse there, and and um, just as a way to say thanks, you know. Yeah. And um, so we arranged a, a time and day, and I went back there and uh, spent lunch with them, and we talked about uh, what went on that day, and that's how I learned about how many shocks I got. Uh, you know, um, learned about uh, who all was involved with it mm. uh, we took a picture together they ended up putting it on you know facebook uh for the it's beautiful fire department so it was wow. it was really nice um and certainly it also uh, again gave me a, a bit of closure and, and understanding you know what transpired when when i you know was out of it i actually wished i because it's been now two years uh for me but i actually wish that i would also have been able to meet the people who were able to save me, but I have no idea. Well, I know the hospital that I could call, but I don't know if they would ever know who were the people that 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 saved me. Actually, um, what about uh, where's your local uh, paramedics or fire department out of? Oh, I mean, I was also in a bit of a lucky p place, like you were, like. Uh, the hospital where the ambulance came from was also just like five minutes from where I lived. And so they were also able to be there like in just two, three minutes, which is insane actually. Uh, but I don't know if I would call the hospital what I would ask for. Like, oh, that day I was... Do they... Well, maybe I could ask. Maybe they have the, the files of that. So so here in the, in the States... Um you can call and, and ask for an incident report um, oh, yeah. because uh, because the police and fire department responded to the 911 call um, that uh, they they have to file a report as to 
um, you know, what they did during that call. Mm. And so I actually ended up getting a, a pretty detailed report from the fire department um, where, so our fire department also has paramedics. Yep. And, um, and so it was like a four page report and went down to the minute as to, you know, what they did when they administered, you know, different uh, protocols and treatment, when the shocks were delivered, um, what time I got to the hospital, uh, who was here on site. Um, so it was pretty detailed from, from that aspect. They gave so you those papers? Yes. Okay. Actually, that will be very interesting to still uh, kind of know, right? Yeah. Hmm. I would think so. I mean, it's certainly worth uh, seeing if you can't track it down. Yeah, yeah. yeah I will actually try. Um, and I actually spoke uh, a few weeks ago with another um, cardiac arrest survivor, Alan, who also met up with the people who saved him. But he also said, like, yeah, how do you thank someone who saved your life? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> what do you do, you know? I, I mean, it's really hard to thank someone appropriately in a way. How do you do that even? Besides well, saying thank you, of course. Right. And there's no measure that, you know. Yeah. And of course, they're very humble about it. And they say, well, I was just doing my job. And yeah. um, I my what I said to them is, unlike other jobs, I'm so glad that you showed up today for your job because I wouldn't be here if you didn't show up. And yeah. um, so, you know, that's what they do. They, they show up for people when they need them the most. And, um, and you know, it's such a, um, an incredible, um, incredibly, uh, I don't even have the words. Yeah. Um, it means so much to not only the people that uh, they're saving, but those around them that they can, that they have those people that will do that. You know, yeah. much like, well, any first responder, really, you know, regardless of whether it's a firefighter or a police officer, you know, it's like danger. They're running right into it where the rest <laughs> of us are trying to get away from it, you know. Yeah. And they look at it like it's any other day at the office for them. And it's really just um, an incredible type of person that can do that. It's pretty remarkable what they do, actually. Yeah. They do truly save lives. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Matthew, is there actually anything that you wished, like your cardiologist uh, would have told you sooner, or anything that you wished you had discovered sooner about, you know, surviving a cardiac arrest and living with an ICD? Yes. Uh, there's a lot of things, I guess, you know, fr from the time I had my, my heart attack, I guess I wish I would have known that I would have been at a a higher risk category for experiencing a cardiac arrest. I mean, yeah. on one hand, there's nothing really you can do to prevent it. Uh, but on the other hand, if somebody wanted to, you know, see if uh, the people that they live with know CPR, that would be helpful. That's um, so true. To uh, maybe they may even decide to invest in an AED and hope that they'll never need it. Exactly. Um, I wish that uh, my discharge instructions from the hospital had more on it than just, you know, take your medications and follow up with your doctor. Um, I know, right? <laughs> the, the instructions, you know, it, it would have been nice to, to have a list of resources. You know, it, it was two weeks out from the hospital. I started looking, uh, where can I find, you know, other survivors, other support mm -hmm. groups, um, certainly was lucky, uh, to come across those, um, at that point in time, because uh, as you and, and other survivors are, are well aware, it, it can feel very isolating to, yeah. um, to go through this and, and not sure who you can share your experiences with, because, um, yep. for those that haven't been through it, it's really hard to relate to, uh, the variety of, of things that you go through both emotionally, physically, and otherwise. Yeah. Um, so 
for me, the, the biggest thing in my recovery has been support groups. And, you know, yeah. that's why, you know, I really love what you're doing with the Heart Warrior Project. Um, hearing firsthand stories from other people can be so valuable into what you're experiencing and feeling. Um, things that uh, you may not know what to expect. So, you know, some of these um, support groups have, you know, Zoom calls and whatnot that you can join and um, they talk about, you know, how they're living with their ICDs, if they ever got shocked, um, uh, things that, you know, I haven't experienced yet, but it kind of gives me an idea of what life will be like um, if I do yeah. experience those things. Uh, talking about those support groups, are there any that you can recommend? Any, I mean, like the Facebook uh, support group, for example, that I will definitely link up in the show notes for listeners. But are there other ones? So I, that you I found? yes. So I've come across um, a support group from the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation um, here, based in the U.S. Uh, that has um, a support group. They, I think they call it Casa. Um, ah, uh, yeah, I know that. Uh, that's outside of Facebook. Um, they have uh, an an app or you know a, a separate program you can go in and, and discuss you know with other survivors. Um, they also have you know webinars that they host. Um, the Facebook group. Um, there's a couple of them actually. Um, you okay, the, which ones are you the on? Main, the main one is um, studying uh, cardiac arrest survivors. Yeah. Um, that's open to survivors and co-survivors yeah. um and uh and then there's also um there's a few others but maybe they don't have as many members to them um but there are uh, i think i've seen at least three on facebook um and then also i've been connecting to other cardiac uh, arrest survivors through other social media platforms such as LinkedIn. So. Well, I mean, for everyone listening, I will link up uh, a few in the show notes because like you said, uh, honestly, having a support group, I wished, I really wished that they gave that to me when I left the hospital too, that they gave, like you said, that on the page with recommendations, you know, instead of just medication alone, also like, oh, here are some good support groups to join. And I also wish there were like more offline ones, not just online alone. Yes. Um, like that's very, it's so, it's lacking. It's so hard compared well, to ca cancer, right? Yeah. Cancer has so many support groups, which is good, right? It's really good. But more people die from their heart than from cancer. It's insane how many people die from their hearts. It's the number one killer for both men and women so right. I just I'm so surprised by it that there's so little support. Yeah, I and in fact I was trying to see if there was um you know support groups in the area and I think they they are for other heart conditions but yeah. not necessarily cardiac arrest. Um and I think where they may have been in the past uh depending on the survivors and their um, I guess, wish to stay engaged with a support group. Um, some of them have waned and kind of dissipated over the years. Uh, but I found, you know, that there were some um, previously done at local hospitals in in this area, um, but no okay. longer exist um, today. Oh. So it's like it's one of those things where, you know, it, it might have been run for a while and then they, they couldn't keep it going. Um, mm. which is why I think also the Facebook, um, has become popular because, you know, it can connect people all around the world. Yeah. In fact, there's a cardiac arrest, um, survivor group on Facebook also with, from the UK. And, uh, they have a tremendous amount of resources, um, written resources that is very, um, very helpful. Um, all right. I think their uh, acronym is like um, S-C-A-U-K. Um, it's a Facebook group. It's a Facebook group. Um, and uh, 
you know, the link to a website of sudden cardiac arrest. Um, uh, there may UK. be another A in there in the UK, but uh, there's a bunch of materials that have been really well developed over the mm. years. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I've read through a lot of those as well, and they've been tremendously helpful. Yeah. I mean, maybe after we're done with the conversation, you can send me the link to it and I can also put it in the show notes for people to find because I'm also always interested in finding good websites with good information yeah. about all this. Would there be other things that you wished they would have put on a page when they would have like uh, left you out of the hospital besides like support groups, something else? Well, a couple of things I guess um, that come to mind would be um, local resources. Um, also okay. talking about, you know, uh, and when I say local resources, it may be, you know, Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation and a couple of website resources. Um, yeah. Locally here, uh, they're starting to track um, cardiac arrest uh, rates in uh, on a state by state basis. Um, trying to kind of change the statistics and, and look at what's been working and what hasn't been working in terms of um, survival rates. Mm -hmm. And so there's organizations that are, um, are doing a, uh, a lot of work in that area. One here in, in the state of Michigan is uh, SaveMyHeart.org. Uh, mm -hmm. And so okay. um, they work with a national registry. Um, I know also there's a, a university, uh, University of Michigan, that has um, uh, some grant work that they're also doing um, regarding uh, sudden cardiac arrest, and that's through uh, the American Heart Association. Um, so those type of resources would have been uh, nice to to at least have an idea or an exposure to that they're available. Yeah. Um, I think. Um, you know, maybe even a note in there about mental health and um, yes, and uh, talking about the emotions that you may be running into, both as a survivor, but also for your co-survivor. I know, um, right? One of the things you know, my spouse uh, Kenyon, you know, has been dealing with is is the traumatic events that I was unconscious for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I seen from the the camera on the you know front door what I looked like when they wheeled me out, mm -hmm. and um, oh, yeah. it it it, uh, it it's a trauma that I will never understand because I didn't go through it. Um, but he was awake during the time in which I was in my you know desperate need. So um, I think co survivors in general are left out of the the recovery yeah. process. Um, and even when I think about it, first responders, when they're working on somebody, I mean, that's got to be a traumatic experience for them. Yeah. And so, but the fact that they keep showing up for, for work every day and going and do that day in and day out, um, it, it takes a, a, an, a, an incredible amount of fortitude to mm -hmm. be able to, um, to see that kind of trauma. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit up to us when we when we leave the hospital a bit, right? To to find all those resources and to deal with all these emotions and for our partner or the person who saved us, yeah, it's their all is it, it's an all other journey that they kinda have to go on to that's uh yeah, almost ignored in a way or not talked about at all. Right. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of survivors that I've talked to actually do mention that like uh, that the impact that their partner had that it really is ignored and also by uh, friends or family in a way right because we're the ones who survived it people do ask us like ah, how are you doing but it ra they rarely ha ask that question to the person who saved us Right. Especially when time passes, right? In the beginning, they might ask it, but after a year or two, no one asks it. Well, and, you know, we're lucky to have a, a, um, a lot of open dialogue about how we're feeling. And, yeah, that's um, important. And, 
you know, for him, it's a loop that plays over and over. Mm, yeah. And so um, certainly trying to to talk through those things um, and get to a point where uh, you can move beyond it, you know, whether you need to seek professional help or um, you need to find different ways to cope with those type of uh, memories or trauma, the PTSD of sorts, you know, that you're mm -hmm. you're dealing with. And, um, you know, that's some of the reasons why, for instance, you know, I'll get the, did you take your medication? Did you take your medication? You know, and <laughs> that um, that double checking or, or hyper vigilance, I think it's called, um, in terms of yeah. making sure that um, everything's going to be doesn't, okay. Yeah, that it doesn't happen again. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so... Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things to consider in that, but certainly the, the co-survivors, um, it's almost like uh, they need somebody to check up on them too. Has there been anything else that you both have done actually that helped with the healing process? Well, it, I think it's acknowledging it, you know, mm -hmm. um, that that you don't, uh, you don't just brush it off. Um, acknowledge that it's okay. Uh, to be concerned and talk through those concerns and um, and you know certainly as as much as we may remind ourselves and I see it all the time in the survivor groups they they say you know be patient with yourself um, <laughs> you know you, you need to be patient with each other too because you're each experiencing drama but in a um, in a different setting so um, as a survivor, your your trauma is the physical and um, emotional acceptance of what has happened to you. Whereas um, a completely different trauma has happened with the co-survivor in yep. seeing you dead. Um, yeah. You know, you, uh, out, you can't really get more traumatic than that. And yeah, so, I guess for them, their whole life kind of flashes or their whole the future kind of flashes before their eyes of what yeah everything becomes uncertain like instantly because they might lose that one person that they thought they were going to spend the rest of their life with so you know in terms of other things that um that i wish i were we on the question of i wish i would have known <laughs> i forget what question we were on oh um i mean I guess you answered quite a lot, but like uh, what you wish your cardiologist would have taught you sooner or anything that you wished you would have discovered sooner about this, you know, experience of having a cardiac arrest. I guess as far as the, um, when I left the hospital, um, what to expect or how I should uh, deal with um, the ICD in terms of, you know, its operation and, uh, you know, mm. what to do in the event of a shock. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that's been certainly helpful to talk to other survivors about. Um, you know, everybody's situation's a little different. And of course, they'll, they'll throw up the disclaimer, I'm not a medical professional, right? So check with your doctor. But um, understanding, <laughs> you know, at, at what point in time, you know, you should go to the hospital versus, you know, hey, it just did its job and I'm okay. Um, you're but, right. Yeah, that's a valid point, actually, that you're making that also <laughs> none of us almost have any information about when we left the hospital. Like, yeah, what do you do when you get a shock? Right. And actually... Um, Five days ago, my ICD gave me a shock, and uh, yeah, it was my, well, I thought it was never going to happen, but I knew it could happen at some points, and uh, yeah, a few days ago, it actually happened when I was asleep. Uh, I woke up because I thought I had a nightmare, because I was like with a very fast heartbeat, and I was like, like yeah, I woke up in, in complete panic, and I was like, what the, what, what just happened? And then I also felt like uh, some electricity going through my through my uh, chest, and I knew like, wait, I think my ICD just did something. Um, but I didn't know what to do. I was like, I guess I just go back to sleep. <laughs> I uh, 
Yeah. So. Yeah, but funny enough, it was actually the night, uh, the day. Well, that day I was actually going to the hospital. So a couple of hours later, I actually was going to the hospital anyway. So I was like, well, I just, I'll, I'll go back to sleep, I guess. And uh, I'll tell them there. <laughs> but I wasn't completely sure because I've heard people describe how painful it is. Mm-hmm. And I was also imagining like an extreme pain to, exp- to to feel, but I I wasn't even sure that I had a shock, even though that I definitely had a shock when they looked. But I would say that I did feel a hammer like slamming in my chest, but like very acutely, like it doesn't last the pain. It's like very, it's instantly there and then it's over. For me, that's how I experienced it, right? Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't know what to do. And that's information that you don't know right. uh, until you ask for it or when it happens. And that's, yeah. I, yeah, I wished I knew what to do. Because it's my understanding that some people experience what they call inappropriate shock versus mm-hmm. an appropriate shock. It's true. And so the inappropriate shocks may be, you know, something wrong with the device, its settings, or, you know, maybe one of the leads came loose or, or something like that. Um, the appropriate shocks, it's kind of hard to, to figure out, okay, well, mm. do I feel fine after it's done shocking? You know, did it do its job and now it's just on with my day? Or mm-hmm. is there, do I not feel okay if if i still feel strange i guess that's when you may want to take things more seriously and and get to the the hospital yeah Um, but of course you know everybody's reaction is going to be different but they don't really give you anything to prepare for or kind of some ground rules i guess it's yeah here's here's the device and and uh good luck yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah, I mean, do you also have the home monitor? Yes. Yeah. So if the, if something does happen, then because it happened a few times uh, or like a, a few months ago that they also noticed something strange was happening in the night, and then they called me the day uh, after to go to the hospital kind of immediately to do a check in. Okay. Uh, I'm quite. I'm quite grateful and thankful that actually that exists because it it does give like a way for them to check in with us when we're not in the hospital. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I, I actually would like to do at some point an, uh, an episode with a specialist on ICDs or with a cardiologist to do talk about this and to do truly know like what steps can people survivors take when they get a shock or, or what symptoms should they be aware of? Um, cause it's a very interesting and important topic for us to know more about. Right. Hmm. I mean, I've always looked at the ICD as, you know, was kind of told by the manufacturer to look at it as an insurance policy, you know, yeah. um, in, in the event that, you know, you hope you never need it. And of course that's, that's, um, I guess I, there's a certain amount of comfort of having it there, um, mm-hmm. as you know, uh, in the event you do need it, but of course, you know, there's also the mixed feelings that you have about it. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, there was a, um, in one of these support groups, there was a person who had posted a picture of, uh, of a rock that they paint, um, for therapy reasons, they paint rocks. And, um, on this rock, they had painted, um, the expression that says, uh, my defibrillator repulses me. <laughs> and so it, it's uh, kind of like perfectly fitting in that it's got a double meaning to it. Yeah. Um, both that, uh, you know, repulses in terms of, you know, uh, I don't yeah. like it. And, um, and that, uh, you know, it gives me life again. Yeah. So um, I think there's a lot of that in the community in terms of, you know, as much as we're glad to have those, it uh, can be a mixed bag for some because it's my understanding there's some people that have a lot of discomfort with theirs, maybe the way it was placed or mm. 
you know. Yeah, or, or the anxiety behind getting another shock when they had a really terrible experience, right? Because some people right. pass out or it happens when they're, well, it could happen anywhere, right? And that alone, that thought could also be quite a big, uh, yeah, it could lead to a lot of anxiety too. Like when, when will it happen? When will it happen again? Yeah, it's a bit of a love and hate relationship, I guess, that people have with their ICD. Matthew, um, is there actually anything that helps you when you you feel bad, tired, or just frustrated, uh, or lonely, or you know, just have this mix of emotions to uh, to to your ICD, or having a heart uh, a cardiac arrest, or ha having had that? Um, like, is there anything that helps you when you feel emotionally? just not good um well you know i know we've talked about them quite a bit but certainly talking with other survivors um yeah. that helps you know you get through things um you know the the fatigue is real so naps are important <laughs> um you know as good as i feel i often will have to realize you know it's it's only been three months uh, yeah, since yeah. i had my um my cardiac arrest and it's a long process in in the recovery um you know from what i understand is you know that this some people think of it as an emotional roller coaster that you kind of are dealing with um that there's different kind of levels of acceptance over time you know at, at maybe a six month or even a two-year mark where you finally are getting over things um, at least that's what, you know, I hear people describe. Uh, so I, I know that it's not something that you're just quickly, all right, I'm all back to normal. And of course, that's, uh, something I think hard for others to, to recognize as well, because people say, well, you look great, you know, yeah. um, and, uh, you smile and you say, thanks. And I'm glad to be alive. And certainly I am. Um, but in reality, they, they really don't have a clue of what you're, you know, what you've been through and what you're struggling with on, on different levels. Um, so I, I constantly remind myself to be patient, you know, that I know this is going to be a long road. Um, you know, it's, uh, I also have to realize that most of my life I've been a, uh, a people pleaser and trying to say yes to as many things as I can um, uh, to to accommodate things. But uh, now I realize that it's okay to say no to um, to preserve your own sanity in some respects and not take on too much, so that you can focus on things that really matter. And so um, that certainly is is something that I need to constantly remind myself of. Mm. Is there still something that you feel is quite difficult to, to communicate to the people around you? Oh, um, this is probably <laughs> oh. that, that all the survivors uh, struggle with when they see it, but that a heart attack and a cardiac arrest are not the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's like the number one thing that, you know, and be honest, until I had both, I used to use those expressions interchangeably. And and you see that happening in, you know, news reports or when people write articles, um, you see it all the time that, you know, they'll say so-and-so had a had a cardiac arrest and then they had their, you know, or and while they had their car, their heart attack and it'll just, you know, be interchangeable, the terms. Um, but uh Certainly, that's that's uh, probably the number one thing. So when when you tell people like, "Oh, I had a cardiac arrest," people are like, "Ah, so you were conscious," and or like they were like, "Ah, thinking that you had a heart attack." Actually, yeah, but I guess I can say that I've had both. So you, you so, did actually had both, yeah. And um, so I'll explain the differences between the two, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, and of course, see, there's all kinds of descriptions out there. You'll you'll see them from time to time. One essentially is a plumbing. You know, the the heart gets blocked up, and you need to unblock it. That's the heart attack. But you know, from what the statistics I've seen is that 95 percent of people will survive a heart attack if they get treatment within 90 minutes. 
to unblock that. Um, and generally, you know, you're awake for a heart attack. You know, I know I was all the way to the hospital, moaning all the way to the hospital. I was, you know, sitting in the passenger side of the, you know, just, ah. <laughs> um, but uh, conversely, the statistics for cardiac arrest, you are unconscious and you have, you know, 10% or less in, in most ge geographies of, of making it. Yeah. And so it's a completely different statistic. So yeah, um, like a dramatic difference of, of like survival rate, right? Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they're, they're, it's the number one killer, you know, of, of, of people and, and, um, but it's a, a common mistake that, that people make that interchange those, those terms because they just don't understand. And I was guilty of that, like I said before, you know, not really understanding the two. Um, and I guess uh, the second part is, so while I am so glad to be alive um, and have the second chance at life, uh, ultimately, death was the easy thing. Um, it's living that's hard. And so um, each day, you know, there's, there's struggles and challenges, but I wouldn't change a thing. You know, I'm glad to be here. Um, and so I, I certainly feel for those people that, um, you know, that think otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. That's actually, I mean, a thought that I had as well, like suffering is far worse than, than death in a way, right? Like you don't want to live your whole life and suffer every day. That's far worse than than having peace and, and being that being dead. Um, it takes, yeah, it takes a lot of energy to continue and far more than, than sleeping forever. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Is there anything more of like a, of a, something that is very difficult to communicate or would you say that those are the two kind of main Things. I would, I, I would also probably add along the lines of, you know, that uh, much like the saying goes, you never know what somebody's going through. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I may look fine, you know, because having had a heart attack and a cardiac arrest, yeah, I look great. Um, yeah. But you never know how people are struggling inside. So certainly, um, whether it's emotions or fatigue, um, or I just don't have the energy or maybe the patience at time. Um, uh, that's, that's hard to, to describe to people, um, what you're feeling and why you're feeling that. Because of course, you know, you look great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think well, almost all of us survivors had to hear that, <laughs> that, you know, people say like, oh, but you know, you died, but you look great, you know, <laughs> you can smile like you said, you can smile and you can laugh and you can function like a normal being. So probably everything is good. Yeah. But uh, honestly, this is probably one of the most dangerous things to do to assume that someone is doing fine when they look okay from the outside. And that's about everything, right? Like people not even to do with cardiac arrest, but people could struggle with suicidal thoughts or depression or like just insane emotional things and they might look fine from the outside. So I really think it's a, uh, people should be careful with, with saying that I think. Cause then it, you're stopping yourself to ask further and to look further of what might actually be happening inside. If you say like, oh, you just look, you look good. Mm -hmm. um, or, or, or you're just trying to pass off a compliment. I mean, that's that's fine, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, but I think uh, certainly this experience has has made me more, you know, in tune with that. Understand that people, all walks of life, like you say, have their own struggles, and so um, I don't necessarily fault somebody for saying, you know, well, you look great, you know, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes, you know, some of the, uh, the scars aren't necessarily visible. Matthew, 
I have uh, one last question for you, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, is there any last best tip you would give to any survivor listening, or is there anything you still would like to let a survivor know? Yeah, so just like I remind myself, be patient with yourself. Um, listen to what your body is telling you. Uh, work with your providers, even if they don't understand everything that's going on with you. Um, recognize that you're not alone, that there's survivor support groups out there, and it's really helpful. Um, meet with your first responders if you can. Um, it's not only rewarding for uh, you um, and, and kind of help put closure to certain things and but it's also rewarding for them and, and, and the work that they do every day. Um, I'd say um, let people help you. You know, there's sometimes where people will say, you know, hey, is there anything I can do? And we're so often saying, no, I got it. I got it. You know, yes. uh, some of that's a little bit on the, on the pride side, but um, people also just want to help. So uh, take them up on it. Uh, yeah. make those connections and um, you know if people want to pray for you let them pray for you I mean there's mm -hmm. you know wh whatever the spirituality may be um, I think that it's it's okay to be uh, mindful and self-aware and yeah. um, I think that it's also okay to be vulnerable with people to share what you're feeling inside and don't hold it in um, if you need professional help, go get it. Um, if, if you need to take some medications to help in the, the coping mechanism, you know, those are all different tools, right? Um, you've been through a traumatic experience and sometimes you need a little extra help to let that anxiety and emotions that may be holding us back. Um, Worry is a useless emotion. You know, I know a lot of survivors are worried about what happened next and um, worried it'll happen again, worried about getting shocked from their ICD. Uh, but worry never really helps anything, at least not that I'm aware of, you know. So I look at worry as a useless emotion. And so don't give it a place. Um, don't give it any more power over you. Um, and I guess, you know, as a parting thought, I think of it as, look, life hit the pause button on you. Um, just remember, you've already experienced the worst. You died. And, um, yeah, it sucks in a lot of ways. And But there's a reason that you're here. And you get to decide what happens next. And so make it a great comeback story. <laughs> yeah. That's the way you got to look at it. Yeah, I love that. Matthew, thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and for being here on the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And that concludes another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I do hope you found this conversation between me and Matthew helpful and that it provided some form of support. To find any resources mentioned in this episode, do check out the show notes located in the description of this episode or go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Matthew. With that, maybe I will welcome you again on another episode. Until then, this is Yelis Vaas signing off. Before you go, i uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior project which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, 
as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.